Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Shirtless Plantain Show, the Euros edition. This is your host, Dean, and today I am here with my friend, my co-host, Coach. What's going on, Coach? Stuck him. <laughs> I don't even like England. I don't even like England. That's just a fact. Can, can we, Those who just like... followed this long enough know that I don't like England, but I'm fed up of seeing this shit. We so can't exactly. even like wait to get to the England section before no. you start oh. the campaign. By the way, I'm 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 coach, yeah. Lob Rucci on um on, on Twitter, all that shit. Sack him, please. Thank you. <laughs> all right, before we get to that, there were two other games to look at today. Uh Serbia and Slovenia yeah. tied one one in uh what was I believe the most peaceful Balkan <laughs> game of the tournament. So yeah. Far. Um I got the impression I didn't really get to watch this one too crazy, coach, but I got the impression that both te- both teams were kind of wasteful. They were open. Yeah, I'll be honest. Wasteful. I'll be honest with you, I think Slovenia just accepted that they weren't as good as as um Serbia. As, as Serbia and they knew they had a, an incredible goalkeeper basically. <laughs> and just no Yeah, and, and just banked on that. And to be honest, Serbia didn't really create that many great chances, if I'm being honest. But they did put them under quite a bit of pressure and they had most of the ball. Um but the goal that <laughs> The goal that they scored, the goal that Slovenia scored was really, really funny because their fullback scored it. And the only reason why they scored that goal is because the the sub that came on eventually, um, his first touch was so bad. Sorry, he got subbed off in the end, my bad, sorry. But his first touch was so bad when he was trying to take on their fullback in um, Karsinic that he just nicked the ball off him, basically, and he's passed it in, into midfield and just carried his run into the box but he's nicked it off him I think 30 yards from his own goal do you know how bad your first touch has to be like for you to cause a goal basically from that end and I was, it just made me laugh because fundamentals like that are always going to be important you know it can literally cost your team a goal even if you lose it 30 yards from from the opposition goal kind of thing and it was a really good really w- work, well worked team goal as well um, yeah the problem but, with that goal for me coach real quick yeah. was that the way the fullback finished it at the far post. Yeah. Just because I saw that go live. Yeah. And it just took me back to the Emirates when Arsenal hosted a team whose name starts with Aston. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I was like, can someone cut this cross out before someone finishes at the far post? No. Yeah. No one did that. No one did that. Went all the way through. And this guy scored the goal in the 69th minute. And you nice. know the rules here. Nice. <laughs> on we go. <laughs> Carry on, coach. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was, it was a good goal. Um. And then he got a bit confident after that. He had a couple. He had a shot afterwards after that. You know, thinking, yeah, I'm the man now, kind of thing. As you do as a fullback, you know, you start feeling yourself. But um, Serbia made some interesting changes. I mean, Vlaovic just seems to. I don't think Vlaovic has finished a game so far. Um, and he, you know, he keeps on getting subbed off for 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 Jovic. Um, Tadic eventually came off as well. And I was actually a bit confused why Tadic didn't start the last game unless he was injured, but he came off as well. But... Yeah, he was beefing the coach, you know, because after that game, when he got yeah. interviewed, he was talking about, I'm the most talented player on the team, I should be starting. <laughs> he didn't say he's not wrong. Yeah, he's, he's not, not wrong. wrong, you know, he's... but, um, the co- you know, the coach obviously checked him for that. You can't be talking all crazy during a tournament. Yeah. But yeah, he got to play today and um, I wouldn't say he, he covered himself in glory. No. Um, they were losing when he went off. No. No, so he um yeah, so he, he, again he he went off kind of thing, and Jovic came on. Jovic had, I think, a couple of chances before, before he actually scored, and it was it was it was essentially the last kick of the game. And I I won't lie to you, I wasn't mad that they scored. To be honest, I feel like they did deserve something from the game, and it keeps the group interesting for me as well. That's what that's the main thing. I, I hate when we go into the last game and the top two teams are really qualified. Like I hate that. Like let's keep the jeopardy going. All the way through, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, you think you think the Slovenians would have done everything in their power to hang on to that victory, you know, because it would have been a historic victory for them. I think yeah. it would have been the first time they beat Serbia, mm. and just like they're the the most famous Slovenian on the planet, Luka Doncic, these niggas cannot defend. No. <laughs> yeah, so no. they paid the price, but they're both still in the tournament for now. Yeah. Um, both of them would definitely not be making it. Um, the next thing we're covering is Spain against Italy, and um, I have to say, Coach, this was a a bit anticlimactic, a bit underwhelming. Not because I expected a lot of out of Italy, but I expected more than we got. I mean, the yeah. score did not do Spain's dominance justice. This was no. a 
the dominance in this game, the chance creation in this game, Nico Williams destroying De Lorenzo all game. This was a 5-6-0 game, coach. Yeah, we can just talk about Nico Williams. I'd be satisfied with that, to be honest. If we just speak about Nico Williams today, Please, do I'll be thing. satisfied with that. For real. Do your thing. Um, do your thing. He had a great game. Yeah, he was... <laughs> I just want to know how Cucurella felt about a black man ahead of him, you know, running the show. That's that's my main my main well, takeaway. Like, how, how does he really feel? You know, well, based based on how he played, he probably feels good about it because he played really well as well. Yeah, that's probably the best game Cucurella has played in about a year. That's like, the best game he's played since he was linked to Man City. Yeah, probably, probably. Um, but I was just looking at the, I was looking at obviously the profiles of Spain and whatnot, and their front six profile was. Is near enough what I I want and like from any good team. What I'd want for my team, basically, you've got a big, strong, mobile number six who can pass and receive on a half turn. You've got two players, two other CMs who are both excellent with the ball at their feet. They can run off people. They can also their, their final pass might not be that might not be you know Fabregas level, for example, but they they can see a pass. They can both dribble as well. And they both double, like they help their wingers out when it comes to, you know, creating overloads as well. Like they've, it's just, it's really good. And then the actual wingers themselves, 1v1 demons, quick as hell. Both can, like their ball striking is great. And then they've got a, a centre forward who does like to stay in the box, but can drop deep as well and, and link up as well. It's, it's, it's almost like a, per, just obviously the quality might not be the same as years gone by and shit, but profile wise, it's pretty near perfect, I think. Um, for me anyway um, it's, and, nice that, it's nice that you're sharing your coaching philosophy with the people they've been waiting to find out for years now like what how does coach like to coach but the problem <laughs> is we call this nigga coach but he don't be coaching shit you know so he just makes this shit up on the podcast to tell you people <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but, but for real like I, I, I really I really enjoyed it and in, in contrast to to Italy like Barella was basically playing right next to Jorginho and he couldn't. I was interested to see how he came up against like Pedri or Ruiz, and he got battered to be honest. Jorginho, Pedri was running off him a, a lot in that second half, but Pedri wasn't that great in the first half. Um, I'll be honest with you, I think my favorite player from Italy today was Bastoni. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, their best player was probably Donnarumma, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Just one of those days where, you know, they were just on the back foot the whole game. They couldn't really get out. They couldn't sustain pressure. When they made substitutions at halftime, I think um, Jorginho and Fratesi both came off, both midfielders for Italy. Uh, Cambiasso and what's the other guy's name? Uh, Oh, uh, Cristante. um, Those guys came on. Cristante, I think his first touch was a yellow card. (laughs) Immediately. And uh, Cambiasso's first touch was to give the ball to Spain. Yeah. So it just wasn't going to be Italy's day. And um, it's actually admirable that they didn't lose by more, you know, because yeah. I think this, this is heritage for them. They don't mind suffering in the game. Mm-hmm. They can steal the result at the end. And they almost did. There was a point in the second half where uh, Rodri made a very rare Rodri yeah. mistake and yeah. basically passed yeah. it to, I forget who he passed it to, but the cross went in for Retegi, who had also yeah. come on as a sub, and he missed uh, the finish there. But Italy yeah. could have stolen a point from this game, which is crazy to think about given how much Spain dominated it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Back to the Spanish side, coach. Mm. I thought Fabian Ruiz was actually the best of their midfielders today. And he was maybe the best in the last game as well. Yeah, Ruiz, Ruiz honestly, he's just a lovely player, right? And I think the, the whole Napoli to PSG thing was very much a shrewd bit, shrewd bit of business because he could have, he could, there's a lot of teams in Europe that could use him, you know? There's a lot of teams that could use him. And the fact that he's showing out now, even if, PSG wanted to sell him, which I don't think they do. They'd be getting a lot of money for him, I think. Yeah, for real, like he's I'm he's certain. fantastic, man. And again, he like, just the way he plays the game, it's he's very much he can drop into the six as well. He doesn't mind doing that and getting the ball to the centre backs. He doesn't mind taking the ball under pressure. He doesn't mind dribbling. You know, this is a guy that's what six foot two. I want to say, yeah. Um, he's Big, he's a he's, he's fantastic and great technically. Yeah, really and he's left footed. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you know, I mean, I wonder why he's not at Arsenal, to be honest with you. He feels like, he feels like an Arteta man, to be honest, like, yeah. mainly because he's left-footed. No other reason. <laughs> and we'll talk about why you need more left, left feet in your, in your starting 11 when we get to England in a second here. Yeah. But I thought it was a masterclass. Ayose Perez came on, and he looked 
way you know it's really interesting how context can change someone's career mm -hmm. you know like he was uh i believe initially at newcastle then and he was at leicester as well then he was at leicester then he went to betis and looked pretty good this season i mm -hmm. thought which is why he's in the spanish national team now mm -hmm. and he came on today and this game should have probably ended 3-0 because he, yeah, he had two, two good really chances. good chances almost instantly um, and now I suppose Spain has six points to qualify for the next, for the next round. It was pretty mm -hmm. easy for them. Um, I do wonder if you were a Spanish, would you be concerned that they didn't convert more of the chances they created? Um, I mean, it was an own goal that they used to win this game from Calafiori, who was impressive otherwise. I'd, I'd, I'd say it's one of those games where it just doesn't go in for you. And the fact that they still found a way in, in a tournament, that's the most important thing because the next game they play, they probably win 4 0. Like they, it's one of those ones where you, you know, you know when you when like you just you leave goals on the pitch, and then the next game they all seem to go in for you. I feel I feel like it will be one of those situations, man. And you think about this, I think so. Nico Williams hit the bar. Yes. Uh, um, Lamin Yamal had one that whistled past the post that was incredibly co incredibly close. Morata had a couple of good chances. Pedri should have Pedri should have scored in the first like two three minutes. Nico Williams should have scored as well from a great cross from Morata. So there's all these chances that they've created kind of thing. They probably go in in the next game. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. Okay. And on Nico Williams, you know, I don't like talking transfers and shit. But again, he's a player that a lot of teams can use. <laughs> he doesn't like talking transfers. No, no, for real. He's a lot of teams. Right, whatever. He's a player that a lot of teams can use kind of thing. And there's one team in particular that they're looking for another alternative on, in, from a wide area. That is, you know, that's a speed demon. And I feel like he pretty much ticks all the boxes outside of the wage, the wage thing, basically, because his wages are ridiculous. But I think just what he displayed today in a system that isn't similar to the one he plays at club level, but he did something really good. He adapted, which will get onto somebody else who just hasn't and can't, but he adapted and he didn't look out of place at all. He's, he's fantastic. Like, look, Di Lorenzo is is an experienced Italian fullback. He's 30 years old. He's a Scudetto, Scudetto winner. The captain, in fact. He's shit. Like, he's shit. Yeah, look, to, be <laughs> fair, to, be, to be fair, he is kind of shit, actually. Yeah, I think the shit. most interesting thing about him is, is his hair. I don't <laughs> think he's fully white. Like, look, legit. Because he's, he clearly has some Nigerian immigrants in his, uh, in his hair. He's he, he definitely got some blacking in pores, like, for sure. Because his hair, it just, it's not quite adding up. It's not fully... Put it like this. If, it, put it like this. If Tony Soprano saw him, what slur would you call him? A mooly? <laughs> he pr he probably just faints like he did with the with the <laughs> men's rice box. To be honest, a mooly playing for Italy? Is yeah, that even a real mooly? <laughs> yeah, you know, the a ghoul. <laughs> <laughs> over here. <laughs> no, for real, like, yeah, he absolutely fried it. He f absolutely fried it, man. I love when I see wingers use fullbacks to book to boost their market price, like. They on the like they they've they've come in they've come into the game looking at who's on the team. She's like, ah, oh, so you you that's gonna get me my move. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I can imagine. He he, he saw you saw him. It was, it was like this is lunch. Um, but yeah, like no, I I love Nico Williams. Um, and I think you know even if he doesn't get a move, he's he's gonna light up La Liga again next year for sure, man. Like if you can perform, if you're performing at club level. And internationally, you've pretty much cracked the code. You, 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 that's a mark of a top player. So. Well said, coach. Um, so to wrap up, Spain won, Italy zero. Mm. And we move on to the game of the day. England won, Denmark won. I suppose before we get into the actual details, and by details we mean just shitting on niggas. <laughs> yeah. That pitch was horrendous, coach. It yeah. was just a bad pitch. Like, and obviously it affects both teams, but. I think it had a large part to play in just the general lack of control we saw in the game from both teams, to be honest. People just couldn't string passes together, couldn't make good tackles, were probably scared to get injured after like the first five, ten minutes once they saw that the pitch was coming up. Kyle Walker had to change his boots in, you know, for, uh, to get longer studs in his boots to actually finish the game. It was just yeah. a lot to deal with. But at no point did it feel as if England controlled the game, despite their yeah. superior talent over Denmark. Um, obviously. I'd say the biggest factor is blaming Southgate's muddled approach. Like, we can't tell if they're trying to press or not. If they're trying to press, then why is there a line that, <laughs> that deep, even though you have people who can run in the back? Like, it's all very confusing. Then there's criticism of the players individually. It's just all bad, coach. Like, there, there weren't a lot of positives to take out of this. Yeah, I mean, he's, 
he admitted after the game that straight up and I said, this is not how we want to play. <laughs> and then he then, then he mentioned Trent saying, when they asked him about Trent, he was like, um, he was like, we saw some parts of his game where he succeeded in what, in what we wanted to do. And then he just alluded to the fact that there was other parts where he was just basically shit. And then he mentioned, obviously, the fact that England get ahead and then they don't press on. They ask them again if that's part of the game, part of the gameplay. He's like, nope. But it's like, you've done it for two games now and it's been a recurring theme in your teams from before. So, no, I think it is part of your game plan. <laughs> You're just lying at this point, yeah. I feel like. Um, there's, there's no, I suppose there's no, um, there's no redeeming, there's no redeeming performance today from anyone. I think they were all bad. Well, I'll give credit to Margehi. Actually, yes, him. And I'll him. give credit to Bukayo Saka. Obviously, yeah. I'm biased because I'm an Arsenal fan and I love that kid, but I thought, he made it clear every time he got the ball, he made it clear that the way, if they were going to get anything out of this game, mm. it was going to be through him. Yeah. And eventually he came off. Um, Southgate, you know, subbed him out. And at that point, I was pretty confident that England would not win the game. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if they'd actually lose the game, you know, because Denmark, as average as they were, it just kind of felt like they were going to create the chances to win the game, even though they never really did, you know. No, like, but, but uh, they were better coached. They were, that's, that's the bottom line they were better coached and they were better coached with inferior players and I was just thinking I just said if we swapped coaches today like literally England win that game like 4-0 because this, this is a coach that clearly un- understands what he has in front of him because none of the Denmark players looked even though the pitch was shitty none of the Denmark players to me looked lost or lethargic or unsure I saw John Stones look very unassured in his passing when the fuck does that ever happen guys John Stones unassured in his passing. Like, he just looked such a mess at times with the ball at his feet. And I just couldn't understand for the life of me why. John Stones is one of the best ever passing CBs that like, we've seen in the Premier League. Like, that's just a, a, a stone cold fact. And he looked unassured. So, that to me is, is purely a coaching problem, let alone the midfield. Declan Rice had one of his worst games he's probably had this entire season, even though off the ball, I still think he was pretty, he was pretty decent, but there was a lot of shit he did that I didn't like and did annoy me. But again, there was a lot of shit that Trent did, but Trent's not a midfielder. There's a lot of shit that Benham did. Like no, Rice but... had so much to do, coach. He yeah. just had so much to do. That was the issue. Like Trent is not a midfielder. He's still doing his internship on midfield. Yeah. It's like his third game in midfield for England. That's it. Mm. And Jude, like as good as he is, you know, Ballon d'Or level player, all that. Like, bro, like I just don't. I don't understand why he's doing this Juan Roman Riquelme impression. Like, mm. th- there has to be some discipline about the way you play. You can't just go to places wherever space is because mm. the coach is giving you some freedom. There should be a little more wisdom in the use of that freedom. And I don't know if this is instruction from the coach, but it seems as if he's doing even more than he's done in an English shirt in the past. You know, because there have mm-hmm. been times when he's shown that I'm next up, this is about to be my team and dominated a game, but still sort of had a you know, panoramic vision of what the mission was. Mm. This just feels as if he's trying to do too much. He's, he's trying to play like Shobos is forced to play for hunger. It's like, yeah. bro, a lot of your teammates are really good players too. Some of them Give are them better than you. Yeah, some <laughs> of them are better, like, honestly. And Foden isn't one of them, but I think today there were periods where Jude actually went over to the left to allow yeah. Foden to come in central. And Foden did play better today. He still wasn't yeah. good, but at least he yeah. got those shots off. He hit the post at one point, yeah. you know, and that's because Jude sacrificed a bit more than he did in the last game. Yeah. Uh, but overall, it was just poor, for, especially in the midfield. If your midfield isn't right, and we have yeah. this coach in the interview afterwards talking about, well, we've never replaced Calvin Phillips. It's no good. Calvin, are we talking about Calvin Phillips? The, the fuck, who the fuck is he? Like, <laughs> they're talking about, like, they're talking about, like, like when he said it, I, in my head, I thought he meant Michael Carrick. Because that's the, because, because because that's that that's the level of which you talk about. We didn't find a replacement for. I'm not being funny. I can go over. We can go over like um to every single Premier League round next season and find a, a player on the level of Calvin Phillips in every single match they squad. So at Arsenal, that would be Sambi Lokonga. Well, there we go. So there is there is that statement really really annoying me because you have players to my mind who in the squad, who I think are already at least on his level, Wharton and Mainu. Wharton should be starting, coach. Yeah, Wharton I think... should be starting. That yeah, is I think six. He should. He yeah. should be starting, period. I don't... 
I, I think I t- I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I'll tell you what else, right? We see with, with a player like Walton, because of his style of play, I think it's very hard for him to come into the team and be, all of a sudden feel um, overruled because his style of play is to calm the team down. So he's not someone that's going to come in and like, pack, like, no, his style is very calm, composed. Let's actually, if we need to take this thing out of the game, don't worry, that's my bag. If we need to speed it up, don't worry, that's also my bag kind of thing. So, and then you have someone like Declan Rice next to you who at times will hold your hand defensively because that's, that's his style of play, he will. Yes. But then now you can also help Declan Rice with the pass and you can give the ball to Declan Rice high up the pitch and he can do his thing there. Declan Rice can cover you if you want to go forward as well. So it's like, but with, with Trent, Trent is figuring shit out and he'll get the ball and he'll do something amazing with it and then he'll go missing for 10 minutes. And in midfield, I'm sorry, you can't, 10 minutes is an eternity. 10 minutes can lose you the game, basically. So someone like Walton, who's always going to be engaged, or Maine, who's always going to try at least to be engaged kind of thing, along with a Declan Rice, along with a Drew Bellingham, that has someone there to essentially tell him, don't fuck around in my zone too much. I'll get you the ball in these areas kind of thing. It makes more sense. But the most, the most annoying thing, Dean, and please, just, I'm not going to talk about him anymore because I feel like he's defending him a bit too much because he's your boy at this point. But he made the exact same sub that he did last game. He took off, he, he took off a player that's not, that, that's, that's not great physically, but you know, good on the ball, for a player who's good physically and absolutely dog shit on the ball in Conor Gallagher. What the fuck is that? I'm not, I'm not going to talk about this guy anymore because I think he's dog shit. I, I don't know. I think the idea was that, oh, we're supposed to be a pressing team, so we're going to bring on somebody that has energy to press. But it's like one person can't instigate the press. That's something you guys should have coached the day before the game. <laughs> but even if you put Wharton into this team and he brings hmm. some calm in midfield, I think the bigger problem that we've just kind of ignored because the competition for him has kind of hmm. fallen off over the last year, Jordan Pickford. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what his teammates are doing. It doesn't really matter what they want him to do. Like when you watch the games and you see mm. their body language and you see what they're trying to tell him to do, mm. he doesn't listen to anybody. He just mm. does his own shit. And his own shit is mostly just booting it because he's mm. not into that word woke football because he's a Sean Dyche player. He plays at everything. <laughs> he just does whatever the fuck he wants. Like it's not even that he's bad with his feet. That's not it. He's yeah. bad with his brain. That's yeah. the issue. He doesn't. He doesn't feel the game. He doesn't live the game. He doesn't know when to go along. He does He just, I wouldn't even call it panic. It's just some shit he feels like doing. Mm. And Harry Kane has a lot of great qualities. Mm. There's almost no flaws in his game besides his speed. But he's not a hold-up merchant. That's not, mm. that's not the best way to use him. And Jordan Pickford seems to think that he's Dominic Carvet lewin or some shit. It's, it's, mm. And I don't care how controlled your midfield is. If your goalkeeper treats the ball like a bomb, yeah. it's going to be hard for you to control games, period. Yeah. You know? And on the goal, do you, do you have any blame for Pickford? Mm-mm. No, to be honest, no, actually. Like, he's hit the post and went in. And he's hit, he's hit the ball pretty hard as well. So I wouldn't blame him too much. But, you know, that's an interesting point you bring up about, Pick, about Pickford and the effect it has on, our, you know, on England's attack and potentially midfield as well. Harry Kane is absolutely great at playing people in, basically, when he comes deep. Played one for Saka today in the second half. Yeah, I saw it. I know exactly what he's doing. And the thing is, you know you're going to make that pass every single time, right? But the issue is now is that because you've got Jude in the team, when you come deep, Jude isn't always aware enough to actually fill that gap. It, it's and so strange. Yeah, you and, and, you should, and you should, Jude. That's, Jude, that should be Jude's whole game. Yeah, you should, you should, it literally should be that, and it feels like it's not happening enough. But even then, Saka is the only one, and Saka is quick. Obviously, he's not lightning, he's not rash or anything like that, but he's quick enough, I'd say. But Saka's the only one that's trying to run in behind from wide. So normally, when Kane plays that way, at Tottenham, or even at, at what do you call it, at Bayern now, he has two wingers who are absolutely off in terms of their speed that he has a choice to play it to. With England, it's very predictable. It's just, it feels the Southgate is just trying to luck his way, hoping that these players will figure it out. Bro, you need to coach. You actually, you actually need to coach. And I feel like it starts from getting your midfield right, get, get your midfield right, and getting Foden out of the team. I'm sorry, I still haven't dropped that, that part of this no. whole thing because I, I don't think he, it, it, there's no... There's no two ways about it. Phil Foden is a fantastically talented footballer. That's not 
what we're discussing here. That's like, and I feel like even me having to say that is, is, is even annoying. So we're not discussing his talent at all. But he, he doesn't play well for England. He doesn't fit, to me, this England team, especially with, you're not going to drop Harry Kane. I'm sorry. You're not going to drop June Bellingham. You're absolutely not going to drop <laughs> Bikaya Saka as well. There's a problem here, like in the attack. There's genuinely a problem here. And to me, it's Phil, it's Phil Foden shaped. It just is. I'm not saying he can't come on and play or even start maybe other other games, but in this current format of the team, he shouldn't be playing. I'm sorry, he just shouldn't. Yeah, it's they're just I unless Southgate sleeps and has a great dream where yeah. the answers come to him. Because the answers feel obvious to me, even given the limitations he's placed on himself with this squad. Mm-hmm. Because watching Kieran Trippier cut in on his right foot at, from left back. Every single time. It's like, bro, like I thought you could use your left foot a little bit, even nope. to just play a pass on the line. Never, never. Just very scared playing. And the guy in front of him is also left footed mm-hmm. and just runs into the middle of the pitch all the time. So you have a whole half of your team that isn't working. So even if we just say, okay, let's rock with that as it is, mm-hmm. why not put Trent back? If you want Cal Walker's speed in the team, play him at center back, mm-hmm. essentially. You know, it would be a three without the ball. Play him at yeah. center back. Let Trent come into the middle as opposed to standing in the middle because clearly yeah. he doesn't know how to stand in the middle. He's not a midfielder, yeah. but he can come into the middle from right back like he does at his club. Do that. So Walker, Stones, maybe Gahey. I don't know how good he is at defending wide spaces. Mm-hmm. Or Trippier, if you insist on playing him. Whatever. The left side is done. But Trent, if you're going to play him, if you're going to use him as one of your most talented players, he should be yeah. playing in his best position which is actually right back, despite the fact that he can defend. If you put Kyle Walker inside of him, then Kyle Walker can cover those spaces when he goes Do you know what's actually crazy? Do you know what's actually crazy? If you started Trent, right, and you took out Kyle Walker, which I'm still on the fence about, I I wouldn't be that mad at playing Gallagher. That's what I would would want, actually, but it just feels like that's not happening because he's like a nice captain, a CD player, all that shit. Yeah. But I'm saying I wouldn't I wouldn't be mad at someone like Conor Gallagher starting if that's the case. Because at least then okay, you'll lose you're obviously gonna lose a bunch of quality with Conor Gallagher in the team kind of thing. But then because Trent is coming in field a lot, Gallagher's job essentially could be, do you know what? Just help plug the gaps that Trent will leave because he can't defend. That like, that's your job, because we don't want you to touch the ball essentially. <laughs> like leave all that shit to Trent. And it just it'll just that could potentially help. That could alleviate a few problems. It would create some more, obviously. <laughs> but at least you get at least you get Trent playing right back and he can he can do shit from there that many footballers just can't. <laughs> so like, like watching Kyle Walker just ignore easy, obvious opportunities to play soccer into space or to play yeah. to his feet in certain moments and you know, trying to do his own thing because he's a natural runner with the ball. Meanwhile, Trent is a natural passer with the ball. Yeah. You know, and you're not putting him in the right angles to take advantage of his passing. You're just saying, well, he can't pass generally, so we're just going to Sunday league it and put him in midfield. It's the dumbest thing ever. And also, like you said, Phil Foden just doesn't work up top. Removing him helps a lot. I don't even care who they put out there, as long as it's someone who has a willingness to run into space, to just hold the width and run into space. And that will fix a lot of England's problems. They're Mm -hmm. still going to lose to France or Portugal or whoever the fuck, but, you know. Yeah. I saw someone say earlier today that um, the moment Germany come up a serious, against a serious team and they mentioned England, I was like, Germany will, are beating the shit out of England, guys. Like, there's, there's, no, there's no discussion to be had, I'm sorry. England mm-hmm. might raise their game and play a bit better, but Germany are a better side than England, straight yeah. up and down. They just, they just are. It's That's not about easy, quality and Easy 3-1, right? There. Yeah. Easy. I've never seen a more obvious 3-1, you know, with England taking the lead, by the way. And yeah. Go, yeah, then, then Germany comes back and whoops them. Um, coach, anything else on this game? England are still in control of the group, despite all the criticism given to them. I don't have anything to say other than just sacking, man. And when <laughs> you've got Gary Lineker literally going into forensic analysis, and when I say forensic analysis, I mean for the standards that the BBC will allow, but forensic analysis on what Harry Kane can, can and should be doing better, that lets me know as well, because when the fuck does Gary Neville ever do something like that? Guy? I'm not Gary Neville, say Gary Lineker. Yeah, when the hell does he ever do something like that? He's just a host. He's not an analyst. He's this, a host. this is this is what I'm saying. Like Michael Richards asked him, "What would you do differently?" And then he almost like he, he, the way he re- replied is almost like I've been waiting for this. Like <laughs> literally, no, seriously. Like if you guys can find it, like it was so. Sh- I never see. Like I don't see Gary um, Gary Lineker ever do that. 
So that lets you know that there's a problem, man. Everyone, everyone might just be genuinely fed up with with, with um, Gareth Southgate, man. Because yeah, I've probably. been fed up with him, man. The only thing I like about him is the fact that he recognizes that he needs Saka. But I think an idiot would even see that. So yeah. Well. There are a lot of idiots on on Twitter <laughs> that, that think that Saka should be dropped for Phil Foden. But Phil. that's neither here nor there. I think people are coming to the truth very slowly, but it comes to truth nonetheless. Yeah. Oh, man. Maybe England could do something like Cote d'Ivoire and fire their coach mid-tournament. That might help. Yeah. I don't know who I'd get in charge. I'd get Paul Merson in charge. I'm not even joking. <laughs> well... On that note, and with my empty wine glass, <laughs> no offense, Paul. I'm just, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, that will do us for today. Uh, Coach, anything else for the people? Again, like, subscribe, comments, all that shit. Really enjoy talking football with people. So, yeah, let's, let's keep running out, man. All right. Tell them peace. Peace. Take a shot.